So uh, thank you for inviting. Yeah, thank you for inviting me again. I will talk about HPC containers and the CIE application lifecycle and also give some real world examples where containers help uh, to uh, run the software and also the limits. So f first uh, about CIE, we have about 500 engineers who are working on different tasks for simulation. So these are the results uh, which are visualized on our workstations. So we have about 100 software packages uh, which need to run. So and also these software packages are mostly from ISVs. So we pay for licenses, but also uh, some open source uh, packages. And our goal is to um, have an environment where every engineer has access to all applications. So this is very different because all applications has different life cycles and that every time when we move forward with updates, something uh, might break or might not break. So in, in the old days, uh, for example, uh, when you did only uh, an update one time a year, so every application uh, could be tested and only if we have a go from all applications or some applications have a no go, we can decide to uh, do the update or not. But nowadays, with security, we are required from company policy to follow the updates. Like if you have zero day exploits, it doesn't make sense to delay the update until uh, like 100 applications have tested and say, I, I can run with the newest update. So last year, I concluded with the outlook for software containers. And this year, I will uh, concentrate on the lifecycle management. I also liked uh, the presentation by uh, Dave Brayford because empowerment of users is exactly what we also want to do to give users uh, recipes for containers so they can change and innovate because uh, if you go through a central team which is allowed to do the containers for HPC, it's just too slow now nowadays. So the uh, application lifecycle challenge for our engineers is they want to use the same software for uh, a car development, which is three to four years. I think this is probably a match for a PhD student, which also tries to use the same software uh, during his uh, PhD, because if he doesn't update, something just doesn't work and he might lose weeks or months, uh, or perhaps it doesn't ever work again. And so the problem is newer versions also of commercial codes often have different results or don't even understand uh, the, the keywords of the old models. Um, and also we need to support multiple versions at the same time for different projects because newer projects of course will start with a newer version of the containers. So we have uh, the certification by independent software vendors but they are also only a point in time. So often say, say it was only certified like Red Hat 7.4 and if you run it on 7.5 they don't want uh, to support it. So this is a difficult discussion and uh, there are different approaches by uh, the software vendors. So our take away of this is uh, for the life cycle just keep it running. Also for many cases the best effort is acceptable and economic and if we can't get an old version to work with a newer update, the user have, has to bite the bullet, uh, bullet and update his model and uh, qualify again the new results. And so not only we have these updates uh, in, in uh, software, but also the hardware lifecycle is, is a challenge like CPU models and generations, server models and uh, you get it uh, certified, for example, newer servers are only certified for Red Hat 8, but no longer for Red Hat 7. So this can be a, a problem if you want to run old software. And so also the operating system um, was sought as a point so to the rescue because it provides abstraction from hardware level. And so high level APIs allow optimal use of hardware features. For example, what we heard, uh, I like the lip fabric approach, where you just uh, swap the lip fabric uh, component and leave the MPI intact because the MPI was certified by the software vendor. And if we swap the MPI, uh, all things might happen. 
And also with the auto detect of hardware features, uh, we can uh, use newer features. And of course, this will also happen with containers. If you had it running on a non-AVX machine and the code was built with AVX enablement and you run it on a new hardware, it will run with AVX. So also the operating system has its life cycle. F for example, the enterprise distributions have uh, go end of life after five, seven, or if you pay money after 10 years. Community distributions uh, refresh every six months. And so also in enterprise, you get minor updates, which might break your application every three to six months. And there's a continuous stream of errata uh, and fixes, which uh, might appear every week. So our policy is to follow this. And then what you will see is uh, some ISV software suddenly stops working. So the hope is uh, containers to the rescue because uh, the ABI is then in, in the container. And for containers, we are a bit more relaxed. Of course, you would also need to update the base image because there might be CVEs in libraries in the container. But uh, the containers, for example, uh, with Spotman, uh, you cannot, it's, it's not as easy to get root access. And if you get root access in the container, it's only the directories you see in the container. So uh, this is a bit uh, um, another security boundary which uh, helps uh, in, in this area. So I now want to give some real world examples we have hit in production, for example, Recently, we had an update from RELS 8.7 to 8.8. .8. So who in the audience is running Red Hat Enterprise Linux? Okay. And who is running CentOS? Ah, okay. Because I, I think the same will happen with uh, CentOS. And uh, so this is also an example, I believe it affects nearly every distribution because we had this funny uh, uh, error message like relink re some third party library for an ifunc symbol mem move. So who understands this error message? <laughs> so al also we didn't understand it. So we, we took it to uh, Red Hat because we have a support contract and say, look, it worked before and now it no longer works. And so Red Hat root caused it because they uh, did an improvement in glibc library loading from uh, to make it faster, order of uh, 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 three to order of one scaling. And uh, looking for this error message, is somebody here from Lawrence Livermore? Well, perhaps you know somebody because they filed a bug in 2016, uh, which is, has a very similar error message. So Red Hat fixed it for us. Uh, so it was, they said it's an underlinked object. Uh, it was, uh, the linking was done wrong, but Anyway, we don't have the source code. It's a seven-year-old application, and uh, so. But anyway, they said now have they, they can fix it. So this uh, seven-year-old bug might be revisited by LLNN uh, to find out if it's also resolved. Probably they recompiled them the things because they have the source code. Um, another application uh, was uh, doing segmentation fold in. STR talk in some library and it worked fine in RHEL 7. So we also took this to Red Hat and long time ago STR talk was converted from assembler to C. And then uh, upstream made a decision about because uh, what we have hit here it was undefined behavior of this thing in POSIX. It's undefined. And the glibc maintainers decided every undefined behavior shall segfold. But before it didn't. So we, we have a, an LD preload from uh, uh, the um, uh, software vendor, which we can apply. And we also tried to upstream this fix because with glibc you have simple versioning. So you could make this case work for all executables and this is all we, we uh, demand because if you compile new you will hit this bug and then you can fix your code. But so this is not fixed, we need uh, this LD preload or use a Red Hat 7 container. So the next thing uh, was on MPI startups, uh, we had hangs with 100% uh, CPU but only with Numa machines. 
So this also was interesting because the root cause was a kernel change for the file size of the CPU list virtual file. So somebody decided it's a virtual file, so zero is the same like four kilobyte. So why not zero? There is no reason. But the reason is there is some uh, vendor MPI which goes in infinite uh, CPU loop. So it, it probably it's a bug, uh, but uh, so if, if you read a zero size file and you want just the CPU list, uh, so you can discuss what's the right thing. But Linus Torvalds has a right saying, if a kernel change breaks user space, it has to be reverted. So this was also fixed by Red Hat uh, for us, so this also uh, works again. And also, if you try to reproduce the things, so this bug only affected NUMA machines. So you, if, if you had a single socket workstation, it just worked. And this is always uh, irritating for our users. It works on the neighbor's machine, but it does not work on my machine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I want this machine. Yeah. And ah, so all this is, uh, some times ago, several commercial applications which had been compiled with a vendor compiler, they all broke with different uh, things. And so it was also the case on some machines it worked and on some machines not. And so we uh, found out it no longer works on AVX machines. And so I think, I, I'm not sure if it was a glibc or even a kernel change about uh, conserving floating point registers. So before, the ch before it would probably preserve the floating point registers for AVX and after this not. And if the registers are filled with random values, you see random reaction of all your applications. So also this was fixed and upstreamed and backported. But here you can also see sometimes it takes a long time to uh, appear in even if you have a support contract. So we had to live with this. And now the last example, it's also interesting when uh, we are now updating all our clusters from Red Hat 7 to Red Hat 8. And so several commercial applications uh, crashed uh, sometimes, but never after a fresh reboot. So we had been hounding this bug for three to four weeks. And so also the, the error message is very characteristic. This is a 45 fail. So it's, it's really some Fortran code, which uh, I, I think you have these memory uh, checkers which want to avoid uh, to over scribble uh, uh, other memory. And what we found out, uh, it only triggers when you redirect standard in or standard out, which you are doing on HPC, but not on your workstation. <coughs> on HPC, you want the output of all your applications. So it did not, at first, did not uh, reproduce on workstation. And also on HPC, it was uh, just a random discovery. It would only crash if the process ID is larger than one million. So probably this uh, vendor library has some field which has six characters and with one million you have seven characters. So it scribbles over some uh, array. So why did it break with Red Hat 8? Because Red Hat 7 has an, a PID max configured for the kernel, like uh, 40,000, and then it turns over. And Red Hat 8 has uh, the full size, like 4 million. So this is clearly an application bug, which was sleeping all the time, all the years we used uh, RHEL 7. And so what can you do with a container? Each container starts at PID 1, so it will never occur in the container. And I talked to the administrators of another data center in the Volkswagen group, and they say reboot uh, all uh, clusters before they reach 1 million PID to get rid of this bug because they don't have containers. Uh, yeah, that's, that's also, but you, you have to do it, and then perhaps you forget it, and then. Uh, it's always difficult to change uh, default values. Ah, I oh, know I, I have a last example. I call this the Quattocalypse because all Qt applications had been affected by this. Uh, everything which was relying on Qt was hanging with zero percent CPU or core damp or other misbehavior. And so this root cause was because Red Hat backports upstream uh, enhancements to their kernels. And here they backported some new system calls or IO controls in uh, another order than upstream. And the QT library just looked if 
there is a system call available, and if this is available, they think other things are also uh, usable. So uh, this also we took so to Red Hat uh, support, and they they fixed uh, it already. Also in in uh, Red Hat eight point six because this was uh, such an urgent uh, problem. So my last uh, slide, so real world life cycle conclusion. So four uh, of these breakages could have been resolved by containers. We are not yet in full production. And two are in kernel. So this is what you can see in, uh, in real world production with lots of code and all these updates running. And of course with containers root cause analysis is easy because you can just spin up a container with Red Hat 8.5 or 7.5 and just do A, B testing. Because in earlier times we had a, a lab where we had workstations with different uh, versions, so even minor versions, so we could test where the code could run and where not. So thank you for listening. All right.